Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm actually, thank you for uh, coming, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to go back one slide, actually, because um, does everybody know that today's Harbor Day? No. The stars are aligning for me that. to be here to speak to you today as a landscape architect. Um, and, you know, the, the, the theme of movement was really interesting to me because, I, you know, at first I thought, well, what do I have to do with movement? And then my wife who's here today uh, supporting me, Jenny, reminded me that everything that I'm doing is actually predicated on movement, movement of people, movement of lots of things, and we'll, we'll go through that. And I'm a person of movement. I'm very um, aware of my movement. I'm very into movement activities um, outside of being a creative. Um, I'm into snowboarding and rock climbing and whatnot. But I thought, well, that's not really the movement that we're talking about today. We're talking about movement and, and what I do as a landscape architect. Um, just a quick intro, uh, True Form Landscape Architecture Studio is, is the name of my um, office. We're in downtown Phoenix, right on Central Avenue. Um, Central Records, if you haven't been, is just to the right of our space right there. And we're a small group, we're just seven of us. Uh, you heard about a lot of the things that we do. And um, you might wonder, what is landscape architecture? Some people do know, some people don't. Brian knows. <laughs> My wife definitely knows because she has to hear about it all the time. So I don't like to read too many uh, things to you today, but um, that the, the one interesting part is landscape architects help pr people protect biodiversity and adapt to climate change. Restorative nature-based solutions demonstrate how landscape architects can help repair a fractured society. That's pretty heavy. And um, I, I would say, basically what I'm trying to say is that landscape architects are superheroes. Okay. Um, but I'm here to talk about movement, right? And we all are moving all the time. And I, I love the intro. It talked about movement as constant. Movement is, a, is, is whether it's slow, at scales, whatever it is fast. and we are moving through, and you will learn today, we are moving through spaces when you're outside that were all influenced by, designed by a landscape architect. Some of them are great, some of them are less than great. But the fact is that you are moving through spaces and, in, and, and experiencing spaces that um, do correlate to landscape architecture. So you may be driving down a street. Some streets are better than others. This happens to be my favorite street in downtown Phoenix. You might be moving by bike. I love to bike. My wife and I love to bike. Um, we're always interested in incorporating infrastructure for biking. Uh, what about skateboarding? Absolutely. Um, we, we embrace that. Um, but this little, this little device here, make sure that that guy doesn't skate on the, the really beautiful materials at that, at that project. We walk all the time, right? Um, hopefully we get to experience urban environments that are welcoming to pedestrians and walking. But then after all that movement, maybe we need to sit like we all are sitting right now. But everything is still in movement even while we're here sitting, right? Everything is a little bit more subtle. And that's what I love about the desert, you know, because we all live here in the desert. There's some subtleties about the desert. There's nuances that if you're not observing closely, you may miss. And what's happening right now is spring, right? And I always correlate, and it's funny that it's, we're today, it's Arbor Day. These are happening right now. If you go anywhere in town, right, you're seeing this bright explosion of flowers. And that's the Palo Verde bloom. Palo Verde is the state tree. And I like to always say it's our Palo Verde Blossom Festival, just like DC has their festival. We should start to like create a movement around that and, and, and talk about that. And I think the great thing about that is that, okay, we know it's spring if we pay attention. And then those flowers are starting to right, cascade and, and move through space and decorate the ground. If we're sitting and paying close attention, you'll see that hummingbird swoop in and do its thing, it's moving fast, right? So pay attention. But if you're in a space and you don't alarm the Gila monster, he's moving slow. Uh, and these, this is at a residence that we, that we designed in North, North Phoenix, thankful for the resident who is a, a great photographer. And um, she's an observer. So she's always seeing things move through her landscape. 
Now the bobcat's not moving. Um, she might have hoped that it was going to move away, but she is on the other side of the glass. Or if we're in a space with our family, maybe the flicker of the fire is the movement that starts to create that welcoming, warm environment. Or this summer, right, we're going to experience the monsoons. And that's why I brought a little sensory. I'm going to ask if you can maybe pass that to your left, and maybe you can pass that to your right. I'll just leave an extra one here. What happens when it's raining in the, in the desert? Everybody talks about that smell of the rain. It's a lot of people who aren't from here don't know what that is. And some people who are from here don't know what that is, but you smell it. You're like, oh, it's raining somewhere. Well, that's creosote. And what's moving when that's happening? It's not even raining where you are. It's raining 15 miles away. Those creosote are super active in the summer. You smell it more in the summer than winter. And it's because the oils in that plant are exuding out of, out, of their, out of their leaves. That rain activates that oil. That oil goes into the air and those brisk winds of summer and those storms are carrying that scent to you. So what about water? There's another thing about water that I'm always intrigued about because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for history. Um, this is a map of thousand year old canals that were dug by hand by the Hohokam a thousand years ago. Give you a sense of the scale. The map from left to right here is 70 miles. And that's the network. You can see the dark in here, that's the Salt River, but then the canals are those solid straight lines that sort of squiggle through the desert. Um, they did that to be able to live here, to be able to deliver and move water to where they needed it to be moved to. Our, our civilization started to re-inhabit and find those old canals, fill them with water again. We were just moving water to get from one place to another, right, for agriculture, but it became a real part of the fabric of everyday life. Uh, swimming, recreating, socializing, surfing. <laughs> that would have been rad. Um, but something happened after uh, World War II and all those great trees that were there that made those canals so inviting, they decided to take them all out and modernize how we deliver water. And so that movement of water through the desert now is isolated, it's unknown. A lot of people don't know what's even happening. This is the CAP delivering water from the Colorado River. How disconnected we have become. I bet you most of those people that live there have no idea that there's a canal behind them moving water through the desert. And so how can we reconnect? And that's what we're always interested in. Um, this is a residence in, in, in uh, Phoenix. You can see Camelback Mountain, the, the camel's head. And that may not look like water right now because it's not raining on that day. It's super sunny. But when it, when it is raining, we've allowed that person who lives there to be very connected to water in the desert. And so that movement of water, obviously from the sky to their roof, off that architectural scupper, and then falling within a rain garden is something that they can open the, open the broad doors and, and hear and see move through their, their, their landscape. Sorry, it doesn't have sound. That would have been cool. Okay, so that gives kind of an overview. We're right? just gonna jump into a couple of, of projects that we've been uh, fortunate enough to have uh, worked on here locally in Phoenix. And that reconnection, Sometimes it's a little bit more um, subtle. This is um, Adams Street in downtown Phoenix. Central's just behind me. First Street's there uh, just off to the east. This is the Renaissance Hotel. This is what it looked like uh, eight years ago. Okay. Um, pretty dismal. Didn't want to walk down this street at all. Um, this street flooded every time it rained. Um, Hannies had sandbags out to protect their restaurant. And uh, the parking lot, the parking on the right would flood and you couldn't park there for like two or three weeks. So it was kind of a, a water problem, um, but we don't look at that as a problem. We look at it as an opportunity. And so we, just one tiny little street in downtown Phoenix, looked at a system that would move that water 
uh, through the street where it always did, but then where could we move that water to? We could move it to planting areas and what we call bioswales, and then reinvent that street completely to something that's safe for everybody, safe for bicyclists, safe for cars, safe for pedestrians. Just by that little gesture, taking that water that used to flood the street, used to flood businesses, and take it through these little cuts in the curb. This is what it looked like before it was done, but the, the system was working. And we got a call from the city of Phoenix and they said, um, we have a problem. And I said, why do you have a problem? Well, it's flooding. I said, but the businesses aren't flooding and the street's not flooding. This is the planting area that's flooding. And that's what it turned into after we were, we were finished. And it's a space where people can move through and, and occupy the street as well. If it's not a street, we can have festivals. Okay, so I told you I was a sucker for history. And um, I am a, an alumni of Arizona State University. My dad is as well. Um, this library photo was taken in 68. The building was built in 1966. Uh, it holds the center of campus at ASU if you've ever been there. Um, my dad was here when it was being built. So that was pretty special. And um, it's a beautiful building. It is stunning in many ways architecturally. Um, it was less than stunning on the interior of this library. And it went through its, its time through evolution, through changes in what a library was in 1966 to maybe what it was in the 1980s it started to morph into something that was uh, unaccessible. Uh, you could go into the building, but they created this subterranean below grade entry and people were moving underground and through some tunnel and then into the library and you were lost and you had no idea how you got in there. And ASU knew it was a problem and they looked to us to solve that problem. And so when we, were, when we started this project, this is what the library looked like. And there was no movement into the library at any level at all anymore. Remember I told you there was a subterranean entry and we elected to work with multitudes of people to open that library back up and to allow movement through in and out at multiple areas of the library and allow equitable access and create something that's welcoming a front porch. So that's what we were dealt with. This was. This was this moat they called it that was surrounding it. And if we can infill that, we can then create a space that's welcoming for, for people to study and socialize. I mean, this is a pretty formative time of your life when you're in school. So this is again, what we found. This is what it was before we started. And the interesting fact about the library was that it was the whole lower floor. The reason why it was less than stellar on the inside is because the whole entire lower floor was skinned with this granite, all of this, all of this granite there, three inch slabs, 12 feet tall, four feet wide, just skin the whole thing, very few windows. Architect wanted to create more glass, more daylight within the library, sort of take it into the next century. Absolutely perfect thing to do. The contractor and ASU wanted to take that granite off, haul it away to the landfill and it's gone. He said, well, we think we might be able to use that granite. And, Embracing what we started to think about going full circle, we started to move that granite discussion away from throwing it to the landfill. Why don't we just keep it here? Um, so we didn't move it anywhere. It just moved off the building, stacked it up in some nice piles, and then cut it into pieces to use it for planters and whatnot. So we're keeping the history of that material there at that space to keep that context. And so that's what it's turned into. And now it's a space for people. Obviously the plants are pretty happy. So people are moving by that all the time. And whether or not they know that that granite was part of that building before, I mean, the student wasn't even on campus then. Um, but that, that tie to, to history is, is an integral part of, of what we had done there. And we, in, increase the opportunities for movement around the library, a lot of access, a lot of circulation that's inviting and safe and comfortable. 
and sitting at the heart of campus. I think they, I think ASU says they get like 2 million visitors, visits a year at the library. Even today in a digital era. Okay, so just to reiterate, move, movement is happening all the time, right? It's constant. Uh, sometimes we're not even paying attention. We're just driving down the street, trying to get to where we're going. And a lot of times you're driving by things that um, are really integral to our community, whether it be a habitat or whether it's your backyard. Thank you, Jenny. That's Jenny. These two guys are super psyched about their Subway sandwiches. Uh, you know, th this is a renovation of uh, the Arizona Center, kind of reinventing how that space works. It's still going through its growing pains, um, but it has, it has now public space that is really comfortable and safe to move through when before it didn't really feel that way. And so maybe, he, yeah, this is a community college. I always like to think that he's calling his, his, his parents about some tests that he just aced. But, you know, he's walking through this, like, you know, great and inspiring, calming respite garden. Or movement with, you know, just these opportunities that just pop up out of nowhere. They just went to, to eat at Pitch at the restaurant there in Scottsdale. But, oh, they, you know, happened upon this and it's an opportunity for the kids to do something back to the skateboarders, but movement all the time, right? We're always, we're always traversing through these, these special outdoor spaces. Or we're manipulating our environment by moving, right? And a lot of times that movement is something that sparks memory. And, and that's another part of our work as landscape architects is that we are always uh, seeking to create those memories, whether it's a memory that you have because you experience a space, or if it's looking at that dry water feature, that's the memory of water, that ephemeral quality, something that is, is always part of the thought process of, of design work. And then lastly, I've done this long enough to know that you, um, other than the great movement of the bike and the dog, you always end presentations with the photo of a cute dog. Okay, that's it. So thank you. Um,